Hello and welcome to Education Talk. Now, this is one of the best programs on education on television for you. I'm Wilma. Today, we'll be discussing various issues such as why a lot of students didn't get their first choice of secondary school and is a lady, a little girl rather, that has just gotten into university to study uh, a maths course at 10 years old. Is she Britain's cleverest girl? To discuss these issues with me today is Dr. Chrissy Mafidon, who is a consultant on education. Dr. Chrissy, you're very welcome to our program. Thanks for your kind invitation. And I'm almost calling her a lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most yeah. people wonder how so young she got into university. Yeah. Now, she's a 10-year-old girl, and she has just been accepted onto university to study a course on maths degree, despite not going to school. Let's watch this clip. So Esther, do you want to tell me why maths is your favourite subject? I just love maths. All the numbers and the solving is like a mystery. <sighs> <laughs> so how are you finding your degree? It's easy. It's easy? Super easy. So how quickly do you think you're going to do it? Mm, my, I was thinking about two years. Fantastic. So what do you want to do when you finish your degree? Well, I'll go to my PhD and then from there I'll start running my own business. I want to be a banker. So you want to be running your own bank? Yep. And how old do you think you'll be when you do that? Mm, 16 or 15. <laughs> Esther Ocardi from Warsaw has enrolled on Open University course. After the degree, she wants to study for a PhD before running her own bank. And the girl's younger brother, Isaiah, is already studying for A-levels age six. The siblings are both homeschooled by mathematician mother Omonefe. Now, Dr. Chris, tell us, homeschooling, is that the best? It, in some of our um, students, you find out that if they were going to keep up with the pace of their own learning, you might need to design an individual learning program. So if you say that every child will follow the national curriculum, you're going to compromise the pace of learning of some of our students. Number two, the old curriculum, which is essentially what we're still running now, has not changed to reflect the fact that there are some students that are gifted in specific areas and therefore will not need any boosts and others are going to be needing additional support and assistance. So if we believe one size fits all, then we'll find out that homeschooling might be the answer to individual learning that can be driven by passion. What does it take to take your child through that process? Because some parents might be thinking, okay, I may try it for my child who I see she has a gift. What would they need to do? If you find out that the mainstream school is not catering for your son or your daughter, quite honestly, make sure that you engage the school, try and find out what they can do differently. If the teachers or the school still find that they are unable to accommodate your son or your daughter, then you're left with no option, except you want to compromise the pace or take the child off the school. Because the primary role of the educator rests essentially with the parent. The law does not say that you have to send your child to school. The but law that means one parent would have to stay at home. Yes, to yes. This is where the cost comes into it. The, the benefit is that the child goes at their own pace. The cost means essentially that you have to have one of the parents that is ready to do the research, get the materials, source the materials, and be able to deliver the material to the child in a way that the child will keep interest in their subject of learning. So if you are not able to do that research or you don't have the time to spend with your son or your daughter, then you might find out that it's, uh, it's going to be a very difficult job for you. While homeschooling, uh, are the parents bound to follow the national curriculum or do they have to drop their own curriculum even though they have some flexibility? Uh, maximum flexibility. They don't have to follow the national curriculum. They just need to make sure that the child is engaged and the child is given particular materials. So unlike in the school system, where you have to follow Ofsted, you have to follow health and safety, you have to follow a whole lot, a whole barrage of things that might not be relevant to the child's learning. In fact, most times they're not relevant to the child's individual learning, they are just relevant to running an institution or running to an organization. And then you find out that, oh, really, homeschooling a child, a particular child, particularly those ones that are self-driven, 
those ones that have a lot of initiative, and those ones that can do things independently. So those are the characteristics I'll look for in a child in terms of deciding whether to homeschool or to send the child to um, a school. So the only reason why Esther Okade has an edge over her peers is because she's homeschooled? It's because she's homeschooled and she has a parent that has the body of knowledge in that area of interest. Because her mom is a mathematician. Yes, her mom is a mathematician. And there are many boys and girls up and down the country, if their parents invest the same amount of time and energy, that will come out with the same result. Because inherently, every child is a genius. So if you start from that premise, you then discover what is the genius in this child. Is it music? Because there might be one or two mus musicians up and down the country now whose talent are buried by the formality and bureaucracy of schools. So a child may be able to do music or study music at undergraduate level at the age of 10. But we'll never know because that the parents did not have the conviction to follow this path or did not have the wherewithal to expose that child to musical tests and musical uh, uh, materials that would bring out that genius in the child. So the local education authority, the LEA, have to set milestones or targets to ensure that the child actually reaches um, a particular milestone at a certain age compared with his peers. Um, for the homeschool... Is there a monitoring process in place yeah, there's by a, the LEA? There's an overarching supervision that, that, that takes place. But the best thing for you to do is also contact other homeschoolers in the areas, in, the, in your, in your uh, local authority or in your borough, so that you now meet regularly as parents, share your challenges, share the, the solutions you found to that, and then be able to make a group representation to the LEA. If you do it that way, then you have like a mini organization, a very loose association still carrying up what the law meant all along. That means to have the child educated to the level that meets the needs of the child, not the one that meets the needs of the national curriculum. Now let's look at Esther. She's going in definitely to become a mathematician now. Um, what about other areas? Was it just maths that she's best at and she's going for? Was she just thought mainly maths? What about the other areas and how has she been able to cope with them? Interestingly, a lot of people ask this because you cannot, for instance, deliver maths in a foreign language. So the maths was studied in English. So by pure implication, she has already, already picked up the necessary vocabulary to be able to understand maths at A level. She understands the, the comprehension because there are some passages given sometimes in the maths paper for the child to be able to work through. So you see that individual subject that, separate, that is separated in school sometimes is artificial. Because in maths, you have integrated map reading, you have data analysis, which will have come up in your biology or chemistry. So she's chosen a subject that really embraces all the other subjects of the curriculum. So I do, I'm not afraid for one minute of her, de her being deficient in one area or the other. Because some people are wondering, how can a 10-year-old girl get into university to study maths? Uh, yeah, it, it is very possible if you don't follow the pace of the school system. So the pace of the school system is actually generalistic yes. and it actually slows some students down. It shows more than 50% of the students down. That's the, if we're very, very, going to be very honest. If we have individualized learning, we'll find out that a lot of the individuals that have pursued their area of interest are self-enthused. They do it because they have energy coming in from within, rather than give, being given instructions, say, have you done your homework today? Rather than giving a formula to say, formula, like, have you done two hours of maths a week, or 15 hours of maths a week, or 15 hours of English a week? Because you don't have to have that. You don't have to have that broad brush of saying, this is the timetable that everybody must follow. What, what of it, because if she was in a school environment now, everybody in year five, will have to have five hours of maths a week or three hours of English a week. And then you find out that some people really needed one hour of maths a week. Others will need 15 hours of maths a week. So that flexibility is what she's literally captured. And I'm extremely delighted that she's been able to exploit it. And I, I hope the community learns from her. And here's what we've been saying here over and over again, that there's a genius waiting in your child. What you need is the patience and the determination to be able to pick up and identify the, uh, your child's area of interest. What more can you tell us about Esther? Oh, and then the, the uh, very interesting thing about 
Esther is the fact that the open university study is also flexible. So it's flexibility building on flexibility. And then she is a normal girl. She has dolls, she plays with dolls. So let's not have the stereotype that she's a one-legged beast. No, she, she's a broad-based and well-rounded um, child. And the beauty, additional beauty, she has a genuine one that she can mentor or be able to share her interest and passion with. She's still very much a child. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chris. And for parents who are thinking, is home schooling the best for my child? You can send emails to Education Talk at loveotv.co.uk and we'll give you more information about homeschooling. Now, almost a third of families in London did not get their first choice of secondary school as places are allocated on National Offer Day. Admissions body said the population growth first seen at primary level has now reached secondary schools. In London alone, 68% of applicants got their first preference, fewer than in the previous two years. Dr. Chris, what are the best options available to parents for children who have missed their first choice? Uh, you must speak to A, the schools, their current primary school, and, and literally see whether the choice that they are going, they are being allocated adequately caters for who they are. Two, and more, more importantly, you must go do some research, some basic research about their new allocation and put in an appeal immediately. You shouldn't wait. Even if your data is not correct, or your letters are not correct, or your documentation is not right, launch an appeal now, not tomorrow. If you have any problems in terms of launching an appeal, you can email us, and we'll just send you a basic step-by-step -step what, you, what you need to do. And the third, but not the last, is bring out the profile of your daughter or your son that was submitted in uh, uh, way back in October, because in October you had to make an application to your LEA. Go back and dig that application now. You, you will need vital information there to be able to oppose what they are giving you now and include in your bundle of that you're going to submit to the appeal, because you will need to find out the school that you are targeting, the school that was denied, whether it's an LEA controlled school, is a grant maintained school, is an independent school, whatever, whatever type of school it is, so that you can come out with an appeal, because a, a very good appeal um, 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 uh, document, so that you know whether it's, you're going to discuss, enter into any dialogue with LEA, or you're going to connect with the school immediately, or you're going to appeal to a third party. So you need to know this. If you don't know this basic fast, you won't be able to uh, mount it. So don't just complain. This is not the time for anybody to complain. But parents wonder the appeal process. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Very much so. A quarter of all appeals are successful. And more than 50% of the allocation on a technicality you can reverse. So just going through with state by state. Because remember, everything was done under pressure. Everything was done under a limited time. Uh, a window. So there are forced errors, there are computer errors, and there are human errors. So if you just look at the errors alone, that is, the whole system is written with errors, it, then you know that you can identify their error and say they even erred in this area in terms of postcodes and boundaries. They even erred in terms of proximity of your, your own address to the school that you apply to, or they erred in the, if it's faith based, what was their criteria this year for accepting uh, children from a particular faith. So you must not assume and accept at face value whatever letter was sent to you. You cannot because they are reading with errors. What about those who have appeal, who appeal and still it doesn't go through? What are the options that the parents have? Then you are not prioritized on the waiting list of the school that you were unsuccessful in. So if you didn't appeal at all, you'll be on the long waiting list. Or if you didn't appeal at all, they would just assume and wish that you've gone away and you would not be on their list. But if you appeal, you make it very clear to them, I believe that this is the school that is most appropriate for my son or my daughter. Until they exhaust the waiting list and then make sure that there's no more spaces available to you, you are entitled to be on their list for another 12 calendar months. Will the child be at home for 12 calendar months? Then That's you are on, on a temporary. You are on a, a temporary. You've accepted. You've, if um, come September, you need to go to send the child to a school. Mm -hmm. So you can then send the child to a temporary school and then wait for the other school. Because if you're convinced that that's the school that is of, cho of choice to you, then you're prepared to wait as long as it takes. So you send your child to a temporary school and do a transfer later. And you do a transfer later because you are absolutely sure that the opportunities available in the school you are appealing for is not available in the school you are appealing from. So you need to make that very clear. And 
humming on the deficiencies of the school that you are currently attending. That you are literally saying, I'm sending this, my son or daughter to this school because I need a babysitter, quote unquote. It's not because his musicality is going to be developed or because his sporting ability is going to be developed so in the school. So do not give up at all. That's no, 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 you cannot give up. It, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a battle that is won every year by most parents that are determined and are persistent. Those are two key words you need to, to work with. You've got to be absolutely clear in your mind, this is the best for my uh, child, absolutely clear, this is what I want. Now, FutureLearn, the UK's online university platform, has reached a million students signing up for courses. Why? Most students are turning to online universities now. They found out a very easy way of getting university level knowledge. Before, if you wanted to read anything at undergraduate level, you will need to locate a university physically, travel to the university, and then make, make use of their library or their facilities. But now, with just a click, on your computer, you can see every single thing that's happening online. So why go through the traditional route when you know that the university has literally come to you instead of you going to them? But the experiences are usually not the same. How do we ensure that the online students do not miss out on some of the experiences that the students who go to traditional university have? For example, the face-to-face -face contact with the students, even though it doesn't have to be every day. The face-to-face -face contact with the, university, with the students that we had in our days is now traditional. It's been completely undermined by social media. You can interact with anybody now, anywhere in the world, using social media. You can see their face. You can chat with them. You can literally know whatever you were discussing before that was academic or linked to what you were studying, you can exchange that in social media so in we're an instance. about faceless universities now. What about employers? How do they value these um, degrees? The employers should be very happy because they are using the tools of the future. Most of our work-based activities 10 years ago was not the same now. Almost 80%, I, I, well, I was in a meeting with uh, a lawyer that lives in California and works in London. That's a lawyer. You can, you can just imagine how that could have been possible. If you did not have the tools of social media, if you didn't understand the power of the web, you would say, no, I need to be physically resident in London to be able to work as a lawyer in London. Not necessarily, but you are an education consultant. Let's look at the traditional universities. What future do they have? What are their plans now? If they don't adapt, they'll become like dinosaurs. Exactly what happened to dinosaurs, they become extinct. The way we used to learn is different from the way we are now learning. And will still be different from the way we will be learning in another uh, few, or, or, or few years down the road. If you don't embrace technology and take the good part of the technology and understand that technology is transformational, not just transactional. It's not just going to change one or two things around the edges. It's going to change the core of delivery. When I was a student, it took you two weeks to cut a slide and you have to put it in a projector, and the projector goes around. And now it takes you how many minutes to cut a slide on, on PowerPoint or whatever uh, software you are using, and you can project it. And then you can modify that just a few seconds before the lecture. Well, we don't have enough time to finish that point. But let's look at Ed Miliband, what he said. He actually said that the tuition fees have been a disaster. And he will set out how Labour will fund a cut in the fees. How is he going to do that? I don't know why he's coming out with that proposal. It's a very retrogressive proposal for them to cut tuition fee. They should abolish tuition fee. You can fund it by the number of graduates that are at work. We already know that if you are a graduate, you pay more in taxes, one, than two. We know that if you are a non-graduate, you are more going to be involved in criminality. If we dis discourage our youths from availing themselves of the great opportunity of learning, of honing their skill, just by putting little charges like that, that's going to discourage them, we'll find out that we'll have a big section of our population that are either undereducated or, un or, or uneducated. But the educational institutions will not even be happy by abolishing tuition fees. Ed Miliband is just saying, cut them by a third. He should summon them to a crisis meeting. All the vice chancellors should be called around a, uh, a table and let them know that they are not training graduates for the UK alone. They are training graduates to play on a global economy. And it's, we are now in a knowledge economy. So if you have an ignorant citizen, what you are really piling up is trouble for tomorrow. If you don't empower the citizen, the conservative, uh, the labor, uh, leave them, all of them should sit down and say, we want to prioritize the education of our youths. 
the development of our youths is not just education with a piece of paper at the end of it, it is education so that all the citizens of this country can compete at par with far Asian citizens, compare at par with uh, 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 graduates across the Atlantic. If we don't encourage our students to fully develop their potential, we have lost out and as I a nation. And I think we should be looking at really giving education, not just to UK citizens, but citizens from everywhere as well. Because so the skills we need in this country is deficient. That's why we are outsourcing, outsourcing the London underground to India. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris. We need to round up now. Thank you so much for coming, but definitely we'll continue next week. And viewers, this is Education Talk. Now, if you are thinking of homeschooling your child, what do I need to do? What are the requirements? You can send emails to educationtalk at loveworldtv.co.uk. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of our programs.